I think I'll be looking for a new partner, Ben told Gavin. Don't take offence, buddy, but I'm bored with you. We can't pick up girls on the road, play cards, or hang out at the pub after work. What kind of partner are you? Mr. Gosling didn't complain, Gavin muttered through gritted teeth. Your Mr. Gosling was a rare bird among us. He raised you to be just like him. You spent five years with him. What did you see besides the road? And what good did he teach you? How to give every penny to your wife? Well, how else? That's what a wife is for. To keep the house, wait for her husband to come back from the trip, raise children, Gavin said. And how many kids has your Amara given you? Don't make me laugh, buddy, Ben replied. Gavin gripped the steering wheel so hard that his knuckles turned white and his face began to flush with anger. Don't get upset. You see, all women are the same. They just want more money, Ben said, waving his hand dismissively. Gavin was aware that two years ago, Ben narrowly avoided going to prison. Returning from his work earlier than expected, he caught his wife in bed with her lover. Thank God I was sober. Otherwise, it would have ended badly for both my wife and her lover, and that guy turned out to be no pushover. He managed to defend himself, said Ben. My wife is not like that, and I don't want to talk about it any more, Gavin said, trying to keep his emotions in check. His mentor and friend, old Mr. Gosling, who retired two months ago, was his example. During all the five years they worked together, Gavin tried to be like him in everything. Mr. Gosling had a great family, with children and grandchildren, and Gavin admired him and wanted to be like him. The man thought about quitting trucking altogether. What kind of life is this? I'm on the road and Amara is alone at home, he thought. Before the trip, they had a big argument about money. Gavin thought he earned decently, but Amara was sure he had additional income, which he spent on his own entertainment, on the road, instead of buying gifts for her. Amara outdid herself this time. Michelle, her friend, returned from another trip, and her husband immediately gave her a new mink coat. Amara couldn't help but remember all of Gavin's futile attempts to make her happy on her birthday, and how she had been stuck wearing the same winter jacket for the third year in a row, instead of a coat. Gavin tried to justify himself, saying that he had given her everything to the last penny, and that if Amara wanted, she could save up for a mink coat. He believed that such coats were impractical because you couldn't ride the subway in them. His last argument drove Amara crazy. Oh, how wonderful. Why do I need a coat if I don't have a car? Logical, right? Michelle needs one more fur coat because she drives, but why do I need it? Amara shouted something else, but Gavin couldn't listen to it any more and ran out of the house, followed by reproaches that he was a miser and had ruined her life. Now, returning from his trip, Gavin decided to come home with a nice gift in his hands. He bought Amara a big plush teddy bear with a red satin ribbon, a huge bouquet of roses and golden earrings. It was already late and the apartment windows were dark. She's not waiting, she's upset, Gavin thought bitterly. The phone had been silent all week. He knew it wouldn't be easy to reconcile, but he was willing to do anything to make it happen. Quietly opening the door and turning on the hallway light, Gavin was stunned by what he saw. Instead of new Italian boots, ankle boots and fashionable shoes, back there was a pair of rather worn autumn shoes on the shoe rack. Instead of a trendy coat, hats and purses, a windbreaker and a knitted hat hung on the hanger. What's going on? Where did Amara get all this from? Is she trying to show me that we're poor? Thought Gavin. He sat down on a poof near the coat rack to calm himself down, as Mr. Gosling, who was skilled in family life, had taught him. After counting to ten, he went to the bedroom. Without turning on the light, he placed his wife's favourite roses next to her, sat the teddy bear down, put a box of earrings in its hands, and pressed a button. The bear started singing a little song for Amara about how much he loved her, and Gavin gently kissed his wife. But she suddenly jumped up. I don't understand. Who are you? 
Gavin exclaimed, realizing that he was kissing not Amara. Amara had a short haircut, but the woman sleeping in their bed had fluffy hair that smelled of spring grass and something else that was indescribably familiar. In the next moment, Gavin realized why he recognized the scent. He turned on the night lamp and saw the face of his once beloved Clara in front of him. Is that you? How did you get here? Where have you been all these years? I've been looking for you, exclaimed Gavin, bombarding Clara with questions. The woman only smiled bitterly in response, waiting for Gavin to remember his wife finally, which he did almost immediately. And where is Amara? asked Gavin. Amara? Well, that's where you should have started. Amara left. Go take a shower after your trip and then come to the kitchen. I'll feed you and tell you everything, Clara replied. Only now Gavin realized what else, beside other people's belongings, struck him from the threshold. It was an unfamiliar smell, one that reminded him of a home where someone was waiting for him. As he listened to Clara in the kitchen, he realized how hungry he was after the trip and eagerly attacked the homemade food prepared by the woman. However, the conversation that followed left him shocked. Many years ago, Amara had been in love with Gavin and had found Clara after learning about his upcoming wedding to her. She begged for a meeting and cried down the phone. When they met, Amara tearfully admitted to Clara that she was pregnant with Gavin's child and even showed her the tear-stained ultrasound results. I don't understand, Gavin said, horrified. Amara was never pregnant. How could you believe such nonsense? You disappeared, and you didn't answer my calls. I was very hurt, Gavin, Clara replied. Then I saw the doctor's report. I was shocked. Amara assured me that she loved both you and your future child, and that she would never get rid of your love. She said that if I didn't comply, she would leave have the baby, and you would never hear from them again. Oh my God, Gavin exclaimed. That was her friend Michelle. She worked in gynecology back then and she married a rich man. I don't have any children, and I never had any children. But you're wrong in this, Clara said, sadly smiling. You have a son who's almost five years old. Gavin couldn't believe his ears. Too much had happened to him that evening. I have a son, he repeated, seeming on the verge of going crazy. Back then I didn't suspect I was pregnant. I didn't have any morning sickness or dizziness that I had heard about. Only when my belly started growing did I realize, Clara explained. Why didn't you tell me then? Gavin asked. To be honest, I was very angry with you. But then I thought that you still had the right to know, so I went to see you on my day off. I was near your house when you and Amara in a white dress got into the car. It was the day of your wedding. I didn't want to ruin it for you. I wanted at least one child to have a complete family, answered Clara. I'm so relieved you decided to tell me everything today, exclaimed Gavin. It's not quite like that, Gavin, Clara said. There's no happiness here, and I wouldn't have dared to disturb your family if it weren't for my circumstances. I decided to come to your house, thinking that Amara would have no reason to blame you or me, and that as a mother she would understand me. But she laughed in my face and called me a naive fool who still believes in fairy tales. She admitted that she deceived me back then and wasn't even ashamed of it. In love and war, all means are good. She said she's leaving you. At that time, there was a bald man in the apartment, she called him Dominic and gave him orders about her things, which he was loading into his SUV. Gavin was finally able to eat in peace. Clara reheated the cold dinner and propped her chin up with her fists as she watched him eat. For years, Clara had dreamed of simply feeding her beloved husband like this, but her personal life hadn't worked out. She couldn't forget her first love, and the circumstances of her life didn't lend themselves to romantic encounters and serious relationships. First, there was the move 
then the pregnancy, and then the birth of their son. And what are your extreme circumstances? Oh, what a fool I am. I didn't ask the main question. Where is our son? Clara, who had been holding on for dear life during the previous few days, suddenly burst into tears. He is alive, Gavin, but our little son needs your help urgently. He has a serious illness and is currently in the hospital. He has leukemia and requires a bone marrow transplant. I wasn't a donor match, so all hope is on the father, cried Clara. Gavin stepped in as a donor, and the operation was a success. The child recovered, temporarily leaving his job as a long-distance truck driver. Gavin started driving a taxi to spend more time with Clara and their son. Later, he and Mr. Gosling opened a small auto repair shop. They found a good location, and over time their small business started to bring in excellent income. Gavin's family also grew. After divorcing Amara, Gavin married Clara. Their son, his little brother, was born, and three years later, a little sister joined the family. Now Gavin's apartment had become a real home, with the smell of pies and children's laughter, everything he had dreamed of. We need another place to live, Gavin decided, and on his daughter's third birthday, his family moved into a spacious house near their second, recently opened auto repair shop. Gavin's mother was immensely happy and grateful to the heavens for sending him a good and loving wife. Many years later, Gavin accidentally ran into his ex-wife. An old business class car pulled up in front of the new car repair shop and an older bald man called out to the young man in the branded jumpsuit. Hey kid, we need to change the tyres to summer ones. How much is it? After hearing the price, the bald man started bargaining. Dominic, I told you, no one will do anything for you for free. It's disgusting that we came all the way here just to save three cents. I hate these wretches. And you too, ugly freeloader. It was Amara with her husband Dominic. She had made a big mistake in marrying him. After their divorce, Dominic still boasted a little, but then had to admit that all his money was essentially his wife's, along with their apartment and luxury car. In the future, Dominic and Amara had to rely only on his very modest salary, which was only slightly higher than Gavin's. Over time, when the elderly boss was replaced by a younger and more energetic employee, Dominic and Amara had to live only on their very modest salary as ordinary managers. Amara's attempts to have a romance with the new boss ended in failure. He was happily married, and the years were no longer on Amara's side. Young, energetic girls not only stepped on her heels, but also simply pushed such considerably battered ladies as Amara into a corner of life's mundane routine. As the spouses argued, a young worker, who seemed familiar to Amara, politely smiled and offered to help. Don't worry, we'll solve your problem now. The owner is here. I'll invite him. I'm sure he'll understand your situation, he said, pulling out his mobile phone. Dad, come here, please. I can't handle this without you. Amara was shocked when the workshop owner came out to them. She realized that the young man in a branded jumpsuit was her ex-husband's son. Hello, how can I help you? I'm listening carefully. Gavin addressed Dominic, not even paying any attention to Amara. Dominic began to explain that he had come to this car repair shop as a budget-friendly place, but Amara interrupted him. Dominic, let's stop this and leave immediately. She was boiling with anger. All this situation was humiliating enough, and she couldn't stay here for another minute. You're getting on my nerves. Don't interfere in men's conversation. Dominic angrily threw at Amara and continued. Can we have on a discount? Yes, of course. We have discounts for old cars, Gavin responded. Son, make them a discount and hurry up. Remember, it's Grandma's birthday today, and I need to buy flowers and go to the jewellery store for a gift. Don't be late. Bye. Gavin got into his parked new car and left. 
pretending not to recognise Amara and her former boss. I didn't want to embarrass her mum, Gavin explained to his mother in the evening as he handed her gifts. Oh, son, your story is better than any gift. Thank you for my favourite flowers and such a beautiful ring. But I've never worn gold rings before. It's okay, mum. You're seventy. Never late to get used to. Happy birthday, my dear.